From a personal standpoint, men have been taught for years to have the mindset that women need to be controlled. And that's not true. That mindset will not work. Women want to be understood. And when a man understands a woman, he begins to pay attention to the music of her soul and enter into a rhythmic conversation where there's flow. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello friends, I'm so glad that you've joined us today. Have you ever wondered why men and women think so differently? Do you struggle to find or keep healthy relationships? Well, you're in for a real treat. You've seen him before, and we've got him back to talk about his new book, Ignite the Power of Women in Your Life, a guide for men. It's such an honor for me to have the brilliant author, speaker, and life coach, Simon T. Bailey with us again today. And Simon, thank you for joining us. It, I'm so glad you're here today. Brenda, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be with you today. Well, I understand you're, are you in California? Where are you today? You're on the road. I'm in Oceanside, California. Oh, wonderful. Well, you know, I, I heard that this book was inspired by your daughter or the spark of the idea, the concept came to you. I'd love for you to share that story with us as we begin this interview. My daughter came into my home office a few years ago and she said, hi, daddy. I said, hey, baby girl. And I sensed she wanted to talk, but I was emotionally unavailable. And she sat down, waited a few minutes, and then she said, Dad, you're busy. I'll just come back later. And I said, OK, bye bye. And it hit me, Brenda, the next day on the plane that I missed a moment to connect with my daughter. So when I came back home, I said, Madison, you wanted to talk to me. And she said, Daddy, it's OK. I said, no, it's not OK, because if I don't change my behavior, you are going to marry a joker just like me. And her mother uh, said to me at that time, we had been married for 25 years. She said, you give everybody the best of you, but you give us the rest of you. And I don't want the leftovers anymore. Wow. Wow, that's powerful. And, you know, I, I, th I think that if, if our world was full of fathers who cared and could be sensitive to those moments with their daughters, we would live in a, in a different kind of world. Um, you know, so many people are filled with insecurity and, uh, and, and a lack of understanding of their own identity. And don't you think that, that that is part of the blessing of the father to be able to reaffirm and when they care about those moments and those details, they're building and constructing a beautiful thing. To your point, yes, and that father is leaving an imprint on the head, the heart, and the hands of their daughter by how they model love. Wow, that's so good. Well, you know, interestingly, you wrote this book uh, as a correspondent six-week course for men, and I would assume, though, that this is also very helpful for women. Can you can you speak to that, how excuse me, how this might be helpful for women too. First of all, we've heard from women from all over the world who have read the book and what they have shared with us is they now understand why sometimes men shut down when they really want to talk. They now have an approach to helping men embrace vulnerability and not see it as making them less masculine. And the other feedback that we are hearing from women is it's given them um, some tools to create a more fluid conversation without a man being threatened and really understanding that the woman in his life, his wife, his mother, his sister, uh, is there to really help him become better. Uh, and so it, women are waking up and they're like, oh my goodness, this is such great insight because I share from a place of failure. Mm. Wow. And, you know, the, there is so much conflict um, in professional relationships, in personal relationships, I think based on that very thing that you're talking about, because we misread the situation often. And if we feel threatened, then we're coming at something from a fear-based mindset instead of one of uh, positivity and potential and opportunity. 
um, you really have a, a, a finger on the pulse of kind of the human struggle. I, it, I'm just going to put it that way. And, and how <clears throat> people are often marginalized by these mindsets. Can you speak to that both personally and professionally? From a personal standpoint, men have been taught for years to have the mindset that women need to be controlled. And that's not true. That mindset will not work. Women want to be understood. And when a man understands a woman, he begins to pay attention to the music of her soul and enter into a rhythmic conversation where there's flow. Now, when we look at this from a professional standpoint, when you're working in a place of business, the greatest gift that men can do for women in business is to be an ally. If a woman has an idea and no one supports that idea, why don't you say, hey, Brenda, that's a great idea. Because sometimes what men do to marginalize women, a woman will mention an idea, no one will say anything. But then a few minutes later, a guy will mention the idea and everybody will rally around like it's the best thing since sliced bread. And that has totally disrespected the brilliance of that woman. So what I'm saying to men is you champion the idea and say, Brenda, I wanna give you credit for bringing this idea forward and I am fully supportive. That is being an ally and giving a hand up instead of a handout. Mm. Wow, and I would think that that applies even to um, intimate relationships where oftentimes conflicts build, um, people kind of keep score or you know in their their little memory bank of all the things that they perceive as done to them or against them and there's this division that can take place in a in a relationship that was actually meant to be to thrive together um how do we overcome those mindsets when you know just reading a book can perhaps give us um insight how do we then face those fears within ourselves and, and those things that, that sabotage the relationship? And how do we make those first steps toward change? To make the first steps towards change is shifting from saying, I love you to I cherish you. Anyone can say, I love you. But when I cherish you, I release the need to always be right and I become open for what wants to emerge. When I cherish you, I understand that you come into the relationship through door one, I come through door two, you have your history experiences, I have my history and experiences, but when we merge together, we find door three, and we begin to walk through that door, understanding when I really listen to you, I really listen to understand instead of listening to respond. Here's the third thing about cherishing someone as just the first step. When I truly cherish who you are, I listen between the sentences. I listen beyond the words. And I say, Brenda, here's what I heard you say. Is this what you meant? Can we double click on that? Can we drop a pin? Help me understand. And when you really cherish someone, you say, I'm not gonna get it right all the time, but can mm. we build a bridge from where we are to where we can go together. Wow, I think that's key. And just keeping into focus that I cherish this person, um, we can lose sight of that, don't you think? Yes, sometimes you lose sight because of all the noise of what's happening in the world. You hear about the war in the Ukraine. You hear about high gas prices, stress at work. You're waiting for the other shoe to drop. And when you come back to a place of cherishing, it's less of me and more of we. That's cherishing. That makes total sense to me. Um, as you're as you're talking about this, I'm thinking about those uh, the dating uh, season of my life with my husband, and how that you know he was he set the barometer for me when no one else seemed to care about me or want to know me, uh, they were more interested in an image or me fitting into their cookie cutter. I felt cherished. 
I felt heard and seen and uh, that I was not a threat to him. And that drew me to him like a bee to honey. I mean, so I think what you're saying is very powerful. And it that's something that we honestly probably must, wouldn't you say, need to protect in our relationships as well? Absolutely. The brilliance of what Paul did is he understood the power of in to me see. So he mm. saw into you and in the conversation, he came from a place of being non-judgmental and you yes. can intuitively sense that his motives were pure and that he wow. didn't have an, an agenda. And when you sense that, mm. all of a sudden you came into the flow of a mm. conversation where you didn't feel as if, oh my goodness, I gotta watch my back. Um, so, so that love allowed him to just show up and be in the moment with you. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. And I think that uh, we often can sabotage ourselves um, professionally or even within those important relationships, whether that be with a spouse or with, um, with a child. How do we do that? How do we sabotage ourselves? And how do we begin to start seeing those moments and then changing them? Because I would imagine that it takes time to begin to change the narrative, uh, so to speak, and so that we can begin to respond in a much more healthy um, and honorable way. Yeah, I've discovered that sometimes what sabotages a relationship is what I call comparison inferiority complex. We begin to compare the person that we're in relationship with to past relationships. And is this person going to do uh, to us what this last person did? So we have PTSD that is from a previous relationship. But that also leads us to a scarcity mindset, like, oh my goodness, I've got to hold on to my heart because you're going to hurt me. But when you come from an abundant mindset, you recognize that a half a person doesn't make a whole relationship. And if I choose to come into a whole, W-H-O-L-E, whole relationship, then the whole, H-O-L-E, in my soul is going to be filled. It's going to be healed because I'm showing up to serve. So the most important question that you can ask in the moment is, how can I serve you? How, how can wow. I serve you? Because when I say, how can I serve you? I am putting myself out there flawed, perfectly imperfect, but willing to heal in the moment by becoming transparent with you, another human being who will see me just as I am. Mm. That's so good. And I think a lot of people are dealing with PTSD from former relationships that they carry that baggage into the new. And uh, you said uh, an interesting word, a scarcity mindset. And as you said that, I just kind of get this mental picture of how, you know, we are constantly sowing seed into others, into our future, um, you know, with, with the choices we make, with the words that we speak, the things that we do. And I would think that as we operate in a scarcity mindset, we are sowing bad seed, I guess you could say, um, that, you know, the law of reciprocity, what's come, going to come back to me from what I'm sowing? Can, can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, so what's interesting, when you're sowing negative seeds, negative seeds of energy, in caring science, they call that biocidic language. Biocidic language, which comes from the word biocide, is poisonous, and it's language that causes individuals to spiral down. So when I'm in this scarcity mindset, my language is very biting. I'm talking at you, not to you. But when I move to an abundant mindset, I'm now operating in what we call in caring science biogenic language. And biogenic language causes individuals to spiral up. So what happens is you create a new vibration or frequency in language that comes from a place of peace and love and joy. And you can sense in the energy of the words that this is powerful because you're coming from this expanded consciousness of abundance that I'm not here to take from you, I'm here to give to you. And research says 
that when you help someone else, the reward centers in our brain begin to light up almost as if we have been on the receiving end of the language, the positive language that we've just spoken, and they call it the helper's high. So in other words, I'm helping you and I'm helping myself in the process yeah. by speaking life. Wow. And that would uh, answer or, or be the reason, I guess, that uh, we say, you oh, know, I just got a gut feeling with this person. You know, I, they had a positive experience. It wasn't necessarily what they said, but how they said it, correct? Yes. One of the things that I'm teaching in the book is women have a bigger brain than men. Uh, because of this bigger <laughs> brain, you just do. But the second thing is women have intuition. Women mm -hmm. can sense something in the moment that takes a, a guy a year or two to catch up. We may True. never see it. And when you pay attention to a woman's intuitive intelligence, all of a sudden, you're not less, you're more because you're leveraging her brilliance and her intuition in that moment. And you're honoring the gift that she carries. Oh, that's so good. And it really points back to the whole purpose of creation for man and woman and that, that the woman really was a gift because she brought those things to the table. And, and I love the picture, uh, you know, just speaking from my own heart, I love the picture of how the female uh, soul, the female brain, the female giftings really are um, a very um, kind of a, a, a completer picture of the, the Godhead. They, she encompasses all the different traits that, you know, especially with the Holy Spirit, you know, and our comforter, our, um, our counselor, the, the one that gives us the discernment and the wisdom. And so what you said, um, just even scientifically, that really backs that up. And I love that picture because, you know, I think oftentimes women are perceived as wanting to lord over men. Do you think that's just coming from the fear of, of uh, the perception of men in fear where they're afraid of being controlled. Um, you know, I also know that the scriptures tell us to submit one to another. Um, you know, help us to really unpack that for a minute and understand the beauty of trust and uh, that engagement because I do know also that many women are coming from a place of fear and, and, do try to control. So, you know, I think that this really points to a need for healing. And I know I'm kind of pontificating a little bit, but can, can you speak to that deeper place of um, letting go and tr choosing to trust? And even if we're disrespected on the journey, how do we begin to bring these pieces together and bring a unity that will flow so that we can all work within our giftings and empower each other? Sometimes women come from a place of fear when they believe that the man, their husband, that they're in a relationship with is truly not leading the home in a godly way. And that fear stirs up because she doesn't feel, she doesn't feel seen, valued, or appreciated. So then the question is, how do we, how do we grow from that? And I think it really starts with sitting down and having that crucial conversation about here's where we are, perhaps going and seeking uh, help from a therapist. That's one of the things that I had to go and do uh, when my marriage was falling apart after 25 years. And Brenda, the therapist said to me, whatever you don't deal with will eventually deal with you. Wow. And that was the invitation for me as the man, the head of the household, to look myself in the mirror and say, how did I cause fear? In, in, in her life, but, but because I didn't want to get out of my way and I had a need to be right, right? I was in my own way. We divorced and I continued to go to therapy. And what the therapist began to unpack is she said, there's a lot of research out about fathers and daughters, but there's emerging research out about mothers and sons and you have some mama issues. And wow. so what I recognize is I had to go all the way back to the source and have a crucial conversation with my mom because the therapist said, whatever you don't deal with, you're gonna bring that into the next relationship. So my mom and I got to a place of wholeness and my mom said to me, Brenda, she said, I've been waiting to have this conversation with you for 35 years. 
And when she and I finally had that conversation, I was then able to look at the women in my life, now my ex, mm. and begin to talk to her from a place of peace and joy and, and forgiveness. I was then able to talk to my daughter and model something different for her because I was listening to her. I was not just hearing her. So everyone listening to us right now, how do we begin to move from selective hearing to authentic listening? And, and authentic listening is having that deeper conversation about what's not working so that together we can figure out what can work moving forward. Yeah, that's so good. And my hat's off to you. I mean, so respectable that you would take the initiative to take that look in the mirror and to seek help. Um, you know, we... My husband and I both come from a broken road, so I can relate to all the all of these things that you're saying. And, you know, I, I think that um, it really also speaks to identity, um, how we really perceive ourselves is how we're going to treat others. And, and so going back to some of the old, um, maybe the generational mindsets and, you know, things that were spoken over us, as you said, um, or done to us, um, or dynamics of a relationship. I know with my own father, there were things that, and I even, you know, I wrote about in my book, um, that really affected my identity and having, you know, coming from a shame based identity, um, I was trying everything that I could possibly do to fix myself. So then I was just projecting this lie and it, 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 it only fostered um, very faulty foundations for every relationship that I had. And I attracted abusive people into my life. So, you know, I, I, my heart's really broken over how the church widely uh, stands on just the one dimensional aspect of how God hates divorce. And, you know, we cherry pick these scriptures and throw them at people like, you know, nails in the coffin, uh, so to speak. And, and we just really condemn people for divorce or for the broken journey of, um, failed relationships. And, I also know from my own experience that it was on that road and in my failures that I actually discovered deeper truths about myself, about what was happening, things that I was incapable of actually um, articulating or uh, diagnosing. I was able to finally come to some truths. and. From that was the springboard of healing, and then restoration came. So I know God to be the God of mercy and grace who will walk us through process. And, uh, you know, I think I, for myself, I was also self-sabotaging so much. I'd like to kind of shift this into even like the, the, the workspace. How do women self-sabotage based on um, the history and based on the intimidation of how men resist them. And can you, can you kind of give us an, a, um, an equipping, I guess, or an encouragement for how to break those cycles within our, within our own mindsets and how do we move forward um, without trying to control uh, the environment? Sure. So one of the things that I've discovered over 30 years of coaching and advising women professionally is women, um, something will happen where they have been wronged in a professional environment and that whatever happened, they will begin to look at that story of what happened. And it's not discounting it, right? But it's understanding, okay, this has happened. And how am I going to approach this? Um, so as you can imagine, sexual harassment is a big thing in the workplace, right? And so many companies have put policies in place to give women a safe place to go and to share exactly what happened so that men know going forward how they must do right by women, respecting and honoring them. 
But one of the things that I've also coached women in the workplace to also think about is their confidence, believing in their ideas as they move those ideas forward and find champions in the workplace who will champion their ideas. And nine times out of 10, it's probably a man. And so when you find that champion, how does he come alongside you with the most appropriate behavior, no strings attached, understanding that this innovative idea is necessary and needed? Um, I think the other thing that women can consider is at the end of the day, write down in your journal what's right about you. Because so many times we focus on what's wrong. And I th believe when we focus on what's right, it causes us to have uh, a new viewpoint to where we're going. But here's the other thing that I'll say as it relates to women in the workplace, is that sisters need to look out for sisters. Because yeah. sometimes women throw other women under the bus Ooh. with almost a crab mentality, you know, mm. that, hey, if you get ahead, what about me? No, no, no. How yeah. do sisters support sisters and create this unified front that men recognize, oh, snap, they're real. We've got to support them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, that really is. Um, I think that's huge. Women have been um, for for so long in competition with one another. And I think you're right. If we champion each other, really, that just comes back to us. And, and uh, we receive the same kind of uh, treatment and blessing and honor into our own lives and even promotion because there is a, a community that will observe and watch those dynamics and uh, they are powerful. I think women also need to um, anticipate the good in men and that we are in an era of change. I believe there's so much good that men bring to the table and we need each other. And there, we need to give, so many women have come from such hurtful backgrounds and there's so much emphasis, you know, put right now on sexual harassment in the workplace and um, even in the church. I mean, it's so many scenarios where we're seeing this major correction taking place and exposure to so many things um, that are shocking to so many. But in this culture, uh, do you believe that it's important for us to focus on what's good and what's positive in one another and to expect that as we approach those relationships? Absolutely. You know, the scripture says, whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honest, whatsoever is just, whatsoever is pure. If we put that out into the world and expect that, we will receive that uh, because I believe men want to do the right thing. They want to be good uh, players uh, in, in the uh, thing of life and just how do we do right by women? So it's, it's really seeing us from a place of honesty, just let's do the right thing, not because we have to, but because we want to. Yeah. Do you think your book would speak to uh, leaders in, in the church? How, how can it apply to um, ministries? Because oftentimes women are marginalized within the church systems, and it's believed by many that women should not be uh, preaching or speaking, and uh, that their involvement should be limited to nursery work and Sunday school teaching. Um, can, can you just speak to that for a moment? Because I think we're, you know, my heart really goes out to where people are living uh, as they're trying to thrive within our culture, uh, but also within a lot of the broken systems that we're experiencing within the church or the house of God. Here's what I'll say, Brenda. I have grown up in the church. I come from three generations of pastors, and here's what I know to be true. Any denomination that is going to thrive in this next decade in a world of Alexa, AI, artificial intelligence, automation, they must do away with this women can't preach and women can't be out front. Are you kidding me? Because <laughs> we have moved from a point and click world to a touch and swipe world mm. to now a contactless world. And women, God has designed them with a womb. 
a man with a womb. And so you give, you give a woman a problem, she will give you a dissertation because she has been wired to be the solution to the future. Wow. Well, you've had some powerful women in your life, and uh, I'd like for you to just touch on how they've impacted you and how uh, you wouldn't be where maybe you are without those women. And then I'd like for you to also encourage in the next 30 seconds, uh, encourage our viewers uh, who are struggling with these dynamics. The first woman is my mom. Mom, thank you for praying for me at 10 years of age when school wanted to put a label on me and said I was a problem child. Thank you to Miss Rita Lank as my English teacher. <laughs> who saw me at 15 when I had attempted to commit suicide and Aww. she saw something in me that I didn't have in myself. Thank you, Miss Rita Lankas. And to mm -hmm. all the women that are listening to me right now, you matter, you are important. Your words are so valued. So begin to speak life to the men in your life, to your sons, to your brothers. Let them know that you see them, you appreciate them and, they, and that they are valued because that is the healing that we as men need so that we can become whole together. Oh, wow. I cannot imagine a world without Mr. Simon T. Bailey in it. And uh, oh, how I appreciate you, my friend. And you truly are a spark that ignites wildfires and you're a world changer. And I appreciate you being on the show with me today. I hope we can do this again. Yes, for sure. Okay. Thank you so much. And to you, my friends, I hope that you have um, been encouraged today that whatever it is that you're facing, there is an answer for you to be able to make a shift, a paradigm shift that will change the traje trajectory of your life and your future. And we can all work together in harmony as we were meant to. And that is the goal. So I want you to look up Simon T. Bailey's information, and we're going to put on the screen where you can find his book. And uh, I know that this book is going to be a life changer for so many of you. Thank you for joining me today. And I welcome you again to sit at the table next time. I'm Brenda Crouch.